In the Marvel Universe, Captain America was Steve Rogers, a super serum enhanced patriot from New York. On a baseball diamond, Captain America was David Wright of the New York Mets, of roughly equal baseball powers, speed, strength, and for a time, endurance. In comic books, superheroes don't really age and rarely get hurt. They maintain incredible powers and vanquish every enemy who stands in their path, in one way or another. But in real life, baseball's Captain America was felled by a foe that no one has beaten, the inevitable physical degradation of the human body. Except, in Wright's case, his anatomy betrayed him far too early for an elite athlete, robbing him of years of productivity that probably would have landed him in the Hall of Fame. Wright had gotten tagged with the Captain America moniker during the 2013 World Baseball Classic, during which he led the tournament in RBIs with 10 despite playing in just 4 games. He also put up a slash of 438, 526, 750 for an OPS of 1276. He was coming off a monster 2012 season in which he'd finished 6th in MVP voting due to his high batting average, decent power, and solid run production, all while playing what was seen as gold glove caliber defense at the hot corner. Little did Wright know that as he was being lauded as Captain America in 2013, he'd never again hit 20 homers, or drive in more than 90 runs again, or post a war above 5 for the remainder of his career. He was just 30 years old, it didn't seem possible he was nearing the end. He was universally praised as an all-around good dude who loved being a Met and was proud to be a part of Team USA. He took care of himself and worked tirelessly to improve his swing or recover from whatever injury he was dealing with at the time. Despite being a corner infielder, Wright ran well enough to join the 30-30 club and routinely joined the 2020 club, usually the domain of superior, powerful athletes who typically reside in the outfield. At age 30, he had career numbers that compared to Scott Rowland, Freddie Freeman, and Mookie Betts at the same age, at least the dish. A betting person would have wagered that Wright had a decent shot at Cooperstown if he could stay healthy. But Wright could not in fact stay healthy. In fact, he would never again get close to this status. He would hit only 20 homers over his last three seasons. He would record only 2.7 more over the same span. David Wright couldn't have known in 2013 that his time as Captain America was in some ways doomed, that within two years he'd be diagnosed with spinal stenosis, a condition that usually targets the elderly, not pro athletes in their prime. Painful surgeries and countless hours of physical therapy followed, before, in 2018, David Wright announced he was officially finished with Major League Baseball. He was just 34 years old. But we're getting ahead of ourselves a bit. It's time to go back to the origins of Captain America. Before we get more into that, I want to ask you a question. Do you ever wish you had a low impact way to get involved with your favorite sports teams? One that doesn't have a ton of commitment in doing so? Well, today's sponsor, DraftKings Pick 6, can help you do that in the most straightforward way possible. I get it if you're not into this type of thing, but if you are, I highly recommend checking out their Pick 6 app as it couldn't be more simple and straightforward. You pick two to six players, then you pick if they're gonna have more or less of a stat, and then you compete against other people for a chance to win prizes. This could be any stat layout. For baseball, it could be home runs, at-bats, innings pitched, hits. For football, it could be touchdowns, tackles, sacks, what have you. I don't want to harp on this too much, but I do love how simple it is, as it serves as a good way for me to just put my baseball knowledge to the test against others in a really relatively low stakes environment. And hey, if you sign up with code MTC today, you'll get up to $200 in DraftKings Pick 6 credits. That way, there'll be zero stress if your first pick set loses. Think about it. At that point, if this sounds at all interesting to you, what's the harm in trying it out? You can check out the link to the app in either the pinned comment or description. Again, that's code MTC only on DraftKings Pick 6 for up to $200 in credits. Now, back to our video. Everything you need to know about David Wright comes from this one simple fact. No one gave him anything. His dad was a police officer and his mother worked in the school system in Chesapeake, Virginia, part of the Tidewater region that includes Norfolk and Newport News. Lawrence Taylor, Allen Iverson, Michael Vick, these are the gods of Tidewater athletics. But oddly enough, between 1997 and 2005, the region saw a surge of first round picks in the MLB draft. Michael Kadire, Wright, BJ Upton, Justin Upton, Bill Bray, and Ryan Zimmerman were all snagged in the first round. Mark Reynolds of Virginia Beach was taken in the 16th round in 2004 and went on to hit 298 big league homers. Was something in the water? No, but there was an AAU coach named Marvin Towney Townsend who had some unorthodox ideas about teaching kids to hit. Replicating methods found in the Dominican Republic, Townsend would recruit promising kids in elementary school and then spend hours tossing them plastic lids from Cool Whip or coffee cans that would break wildly while the kids tried to make contact with them. Wright assumed that all kids were being taught like this. It must have worked. All had great hand-eye coordination and very advanced bat-to-ball skills coming out of high school. Scouts regarded them as some of the most capable hitters in their drafts. But the lowest of these picks was Wright, who didn't end up going until a 38th pick in the supplemental first round in 2001. Because coming out of high school, Wright was just 6 feet tall and 190 pounds. He lacked enough speed to play in the middle of the infield, and superstar corner infielders like Scott Rowland were at least several inches taller and about 30 pounds heavier. 
Scouts raved about the raw power Wright generated, but they worried if it would effectively translate to the next level. Each team passed on him at least once. Wright had signed with Georgia Tech to replace Mark Teixeira at third base. The Mets finally drafted Wright 38th overall in that 2001 draft. But the irony of this was that David had grown up an avid Mets fan, despite being born in Chesapeake, probably largely because that's where the Tidewater, now Norfolk, Tides played, and they happened to be the Mets' AAA affiliate. And so, Wright's professional baseball journey began, with few projecting what would soon come for Captain America. Of course, not even first-round picks are guaranteed in any meaningful time in the show. NBA, NHL, and NFL first-rounders usually get on a roster, at least for a while, but MLB operates on a different timeline and under different circumstances. Waiting years for a first-rounder to mature can lead to unforeseen outcomes, and that's why about half of these picks never really get any service time, despite the investment the team's made. As an undersized third bagger, Wright came into the organization with doubters ready to pounce. But he hit 300 during rookie ball and impressed with his ability to hit to all fields and swipe bags while playing solid defense. After that initial season in the Appalachian League, Wright was named the Mets' fifth best prospect. By age 19, he was in the South Atlantic League, where he hit 266 with 11 homers while also driving in 93 runs in just 135 games, with 21 stolen bases to boot. One coach said that Wright was a 19-year-old kid going on 30, which speaks to his maturity and dedication. He rose to become the fourth best prospect in the organization, along with the likes of Scott Casimir and Jose Reyes at the time. He seemed destined to break out. The next season he spent in the Florida State League, and by mid-July, he was mired in the 240s. Based on some of the looks they'd got at him, the Mets brass didn't understand why Wright wasn't blowing up his league, so they dove deeper into his numbers. It turned out that Wright was hitting 100 points higher on the road than at home. How could that be possible? The Mets asked him about his routine. Was it different on the road? At first, Wright shrugged, and then the truth came out. He was taking four or five hours of BP before home games, and on the road, of course, he took a normal amount. Now, a serious player might take hours of BP during the offseason, but in-season is a grind, and four hours of swinging would wear down the Jolly Green Giant. The Mets told him to cut back, so Wright did and then proceeded to hit 323 for the rest of the season. At the start of 2004, Wright kept crushing to the tune of a 363 batting average. At mid-season, the Mets promoted him to his hometown team, the Norfolk Tides, but he spent just 31 games there before he was summoned to the Big Apple. The era of Wright was about to begin. Less than three years after being drafted, David Wright was in the majors to stay. Nothing beats making a good first impression, and Wright's rookie campaign did just that. Despite going 0-4 in his debut against the Montreal Expos, he doubled in the next game for his first big league hit. He would get 76 more of those during his rookie campaign, which spanned 69 games, and 32 of them were for extra bases, including 14 bombs. That added up to a slugging percentage of 525, and an impressive OPS Plus of 119. Wright would never end up dropping below 100 for an OPS Plus when he played more than 10 games in a season, even when he was struggling through injuries late in his career. That's right, from beginning to end, he was always better than an average major league hitter, despite whatever challenge he was facing. In 2005 and 2006, Wright was way above average, posting OPS Plus marks of 140 and 133. It's not hard to see how he did it. He kept his average above 300 with power, hitting 53 homers between the two seasons, along with a ton of doubles, more than 40 each year. Each season, he drove in more than 100 runs, cementing himself as a certified clutch performer. By 2006, he'd established himself as one of the best players in the game, earning a spot on his first All-Star team where he started at third and crushed a homer off Kenny Rogers. Against the Yankees on May 19th, Wright hit a walk-off single off the wall against Mariano Rivera, the greatest closer the game has ever seen. He was also routinely flashing leather at this point. In 2005 alone, he had two gems that showcased his guts and determination. First, in Seattle, he dove into the stands to catch a Raul Obanez pop foul. Then, two months later in San Diego, he raced in a shallow left field to rob Brian Giles of a bloop single on a barehanded diving catch in what became this year in baseball's play of the year. The only real down note of the season was the fact that the Mets ended up losing in Game 7 of the NLCS to the Cardinals. Wright batted just 160 after going hitless in his first 10 ABs in the series. In Game 7, he came up in the 8th inning with the game tied at 1. Carlos Beltran was on first, and he struck out. Then the Cards scored twice in the top of the ninth, and that was the ball game. A sad end to an amazing year that saw him place top 10 in MVP voting for the first of many years to come. Many observers thought that Wright got robbed of an MVP award in 2007, but it's not really hard to see why. He put up a tremendous season, batting 325 with 30 homers and 34 steals, officially becoming a member of the 30-30 club. He also drove in 107 runs and played gold glove winning defense at third. All this came with career highs and more at 8.3 and an OPS plus of 149. But 
The Mets had a seven-game lead on September 12th, and they seemed poised to cruise into the playoffs, looking for revenge for the prior year's disappointment. The team, however, went on to lose 12 out of their next 17 games, and didn't even make the postseason as a wild card. The Phillies, led by four war MVP winner Jimmy Rollins, had won the first of their five Pete division titles. Had the Mets stayed in first, Wright might have managed to finish in the top three in MVP voting. But, as things sat, he had finished fourth, in one of baseball's many poorly aging award races. Wright had played in 160 games that season, and did the same thing the next year. Largely, it was like Wright had hit the reload button, another incredible season of hitting 302 with 33 bombs and 124 RBIs, which equated to the 10th best war in the NL at 6.9. His OPS Plus remained virtually the same as well at 142. This year he finished even lower in MVP voting at 7th, but again won a Gold Glove and Silver Slugger for the second straight year. Given his durability and team first attitude, Wright was now seen as one of the best position players in the big leagues, a budding star among stars, and was doing it on the biggest stage in the baseball world, in New York. The Mets, however, again missed the playoffs in 2008. To give some indication as to the level of respect other players saw Wright, consider what rookie Jay Bruce did in 2008. After coming up with the Reds, Bruce asked Wright for his phone number so they could stay in touch, because to Bruce, David Wright was the epitome of what a professional baseball player should be, and that kind of connection was seen as invaluable, even to opposing players. Between 2006 and 2010, Wright hit 128 homers. Only two other third basemen hit more, A-Rod and Aramis Ramirez. His 522 RBIs were again second to A-Rod. His 25.2 war again ranked just behind Alex and Adrian Beltre. He'd also managed to swipe 115 bases during that same span, while winning two gold gloves, two silver sluggers, and being elected as an all-star every season. He certainly belonged in the conversation of who was the best all-around player in the game. But Wright did more than just crush it in the big leagues. He also dominated the world stage in the WBC in both 2009 and 2013. The 2009 tournament was eventually won by Japan, but Wright provided some of its most iconic moments. Facing elimination against Puerto Rico, Team USA went into the ninth inning down 5-3. Just a few days before, Puerto Rico had mercy ruled the Americans 11-1 in 7 innings, and a second loss would mean that Team USA wouldn't advance to the championship round. A bit of an embarrassment since the games would be played in Dodger Stadium. But with the bases loaded and down a run, Wright took a 2-1 pitch and lined it to right field for the dub. In 2013, Wright was even better, hitting that aforementioned 438 with the homer and 10 RBIs through the first four games. Team USA won three of them to hit in the second round, but they had to do it without Wright, who was scratched from the lineup before the game against the Dominican Republic because of a sore back. Without Wright, Team USA lost to the DR and to Puerto Rico, scoring just four runs total in the two games. But the team paid homage to Wright by hanging a superhero cape in the dugout, and hence was born Captain America, amplified when later the Mets named him Team Captain before the 2013 season. He seemed to be at the pinnacle of his powers. After a couple nagging injuries had sapped some of his production in 2011, he came back strong in 2012 after signing an 8-year, $138 million extension in the offseason. In that monster year, he finished 6th in MVP voting with a 7.1 war, 144 OPS+, plus, and near 345 slash. He kept it going into 2013 with a career-high OPS plus of 156, though he played in just 112 games due to some nagging injuries. Nothing that didn't seem out of the ordinary at the time, though. What's more, he rolled into August on fire, especially against lefties, with a 336 batting average, 6 homers, and 10 doubles. But he injured his hamstring legging out an infield hit, and his season was toast. Little did anyone know, they would never see the same right again. Considering the numbers he put up in 2012 and 2013, the Mets were looking forward to a healthy David Wright to complement new addition Curtis Granderson as well as emerging prospects like Noah Syndergaard, Jacob deGrom, and Steven Matz. But David got off to a slow start in 2014, hitting just 270 and slugging 365 before missing games in June with what was diagnosed as a bruised rotator cuff. He got a cornerstone shot and then limped through July and August, hitting 238 with no homers. A second MRI in September convinced the Mets to shut him down for the remainder of what would be his worst statistical season, with an OPS plus of 101, barely average. Worse, his runs above average against fastballs was negative 7.4, one reason his walk to strikeout ratio was 0.37, a drop of 30 points from 2013. His war of 1.9 was a far cry from when he was in the top 10 seemingly every season, but this somehow wouldn't be the all-time low for Wright, as in 2015, the nightmare really got started. He played in the first 8 games before hurting his hamstring. Then, one day in late April, he was shagging fly balls in the outfield when shooting pains went down his back. The injury seemed to come out of nowhere, and it became impossible to stand for more than 10 minutes. Sitting wrong could wreck the whole flow of his movement. In May 2015, he'd get a diagnosis he and the baseball world weren't at all prepared for spinal stenosis. It's a condition where the spinal canal narrows, almost like a hose that develops a kink, and it seemed like it was going to end Wright's career. 
From here, he truly did everything he could to prevent that. I kept telling myself that this condition had no shot against me, he explained. It was like it may have ended other people's careers, but not me, man. No way. What followed was hours of physical therapy that began at 6 a.m. His first goal was to walk for five minutes without crumpling over in pain. A born grinder, Wright attacked his rehab and was able to return to action in August. In his first game back, he homered. Wright would show up eight hours before the game to get the work in he needed just to stay on the field. It was a grueling, arduous process, but he was able to stay with the Mets as they marched the World Series in 2015. They would end up losing to the Royals, but Wright homered and drove in four during the series. In a career low 38 games, Wright had still managed to post a 126 OPS plus with an 814 OPS. Bottom line, he was still really good at the plate, even if his fielding had declined so badly that he was almost certainly the worst third bagger of the year when he was active, as he had accumulated negative seven DRS in that roughly quarter of a year span. Wright again tried to play in 2016, but only made it through 37 games before going down with a major neck injury. In spring training 2017, he hurt his shoulder. He tried to rehab it all year, even managing to eventually appear in rehab games, but in September, he underwent yet another surgery to repair a torn rotator cuff. A month later, he had back surgery to help with the spinal stenosis. Incredibly, Wright rehabbed voraciously again with the idea of playing in 2018. Nevertheless, he certainly feared getting injured again, and as he later said, I was a shell of my former self, and I absolutely knew it at that point. I just physically couldn't do it anymore. But Wright really wanted his children to see him play at least once. And so, on September 29th, 2018, Wright put on the number 5 Mets jersey one last time. He played in two games, had three plate appearances, and managed to draw a walk. And just like that, at the young age of 34, Wright's career was officially done. There was another New York corner infielder whose career was derailed by a back injury that probably kept him out of the hall, Don Mattingly. Like Wright, Mattingly had to stop playing at the age of 34 because his body betrayed him. Mattingly was arguably one of the top three players in all of baseball in the mid-80s, winning one MVP award and finishing second the next year. But just like that, he was done. His numbers short of Cooperstown, especially in an era of cumulative numbers being prioritized over peak production. Like Mattingly, Wright's career was also over too soon, but it won't easily be forgotten by anyone who's lucky enough to see him play. He still is the all-time Mets leader in hits, with 1,777. If he'd aged normally, it probably could have been around 2,580, according to a Fangraph study. Instead of 242 homers, he probably would have been closer to 350. I gave it everything I had. I really, really did, he said when it was all over. It just wasn't in the cards for me. By the time he was 29, Wright had the 12th best offensive numbers for a third baseman in MLB history, with a 43.3 war that put him ahead of the paces of legends like Chipper Jones and Brooks Robinson. He was almost certainly going to be an all-time great, but the narrowing of his spine was probably a congenital issue that he was powerless to prevent, other than by simply not playing baseball. His arm issues were probably at least in part due to genetic factors as well. Captain America never quits, and Wright never did. He went down like a warrior and left a heroic legacy. However, it seems impossible to ignore the abject tragedy of losing one of our all-time greats to something as sad and unchangeable as genetic deficiencies, a tragedy that will endure in the hearts and minds of baseball fans everywhere for years still to come. Now, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider liking and subscribing and clicking this playlist for other essay content just like this. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.